Thank you. We'll request everyone to kindly settle down as we are all set for our next session, which is an expert keynote presentation by Owen Meredith. Owen is the chief executive of the News Media Association in the United Kingdom, representing around 900 local, regional and national newspaper titles. He has extensive experience working across the UK media sector. He will present on the latest developments in the UK regulatory landscape affecting the relationship between news publishers and tech platforms. Ladies and gentlemen, we are all set to invite him on stage. Can we have a round of applause for Mr. Owen Meredith to present his session? Good afternoon, uh, and thank you so much for inviting me uh, here. It's my first time in Delhi, and in fact, my first time uh, in India, for that matter. And it's a great pleasure to be here uh, at the DMPA E4M Future of Digital Media Conference. Um, I'm the chief exec, as I was introduced, of the News Media Association in the UK, which is uh, an umbrella body which represents... Let's see if the clicker works for the slide. Uh, oh, it does. Hang on. Let's go back. Uh, there you go. Uh, so, um, so it's an umbrella body that represents local, regional, and national publishers, and it brought together two predecessor bodies in 2014. Um, first of those, the Newspaper Society, <coughs> which represented local press, and the second, the News Publisher Association, which represented the national press. This combination uh, is a powerful force in UK lobbying uh, and benefits from the unique relationship that local papers have with local politicians and that the national press have with central government. Uh, it's a role I've been in for about 18 months now, um, so I'm relatively new in post, uh, but I joined having served uh, previously for seven years in a similar organisation, the PPA, which represents uh, the UK magazine sector. And there, alongside many other challenges, um, we campaigned hard to remove VAT sales tax from the digital versions of print magazines and newspapers, um, which had always been zero rated as print editions in the UK. Um, this recognized the significant shift in consumption uh, of news and magazines, and it's worth about £250 million pounds, uh, a year to the UK publishing industry. So before I speak about some uh, detail of what is happening in the UK in terms of legislation um, and address the fundamental challenges for publishers in this space, especially into, uh, in the relationship with tech platforms, um, I thought it'd be first helpful to set the scene a little uh, about the UK market, particularly for those of you who may not be as familiar. So there are currently around 900 news brands published in the UK. That covers across uh, local, regional, and national titles. Uh, and together they reach 27 million people every day uh, and 43, sorry, 47 million people a month. That's about 90% of the UK adult population, uh, the UK being far smaller than India. Um, that is achieved with a wide range of distribution models across all platforms from print to digital, uh, all aimed at giving the public access to much needed uh, trusted news and information. Now, among those 900 titles, there are a wide variety of ownership structures from largely privately owned companies uh, with multiple titles within the group to publicly listed companies through to small family owned businesses with just one or two titles in their staple. Uh, but all of those contribute to a diverse and vibrant and plural media scene in the UK. And as the main investors in journalism in the UK, news brands have a unique role in driving and shaping the news agenda. However, like news media across the world, the UK marketplace has been grappling with that shift from print to digital, which is called serious disruption of publishers' business models. And the ability to properly monetize that huge audience growth that I talked about earlier is extremely challenging. And that is in large part because digital markets are not functioning properly or fairly. And as I was preparing for this conference, uh, I was thinking about how media habits have changed. We all, uh, we all no doubt know that. But I thought back to Sunday mornings at home growing up as a young boy in South Wales. Um, most, most weekends would jump in the car with my dad to drive a mile or two down the road to the local news agents to pick up the Sunday papers. Multiple sections covering a whole range of topics and interests, and then coming back to the family table to sit down with tea and toast as my dad, mum, and brothers fought over different sections. My mum finding it always particularly amusing that I would read through the appointment section as an aspirational 12 or 13 year old, uh, thinking how I could craft my best application to apply to the board of Tesco, BP, or some other listed company. Of course, we all know that that has now changed. Those classified adverts have gone from print in many ways. Um, and we wrestle with a very different media landscape. 
we all spend far much, for, far much more time uh, on our phones with digital media that is highly targeted to our own interests, or at least the interests that Google and Facebook think we have. And that adds up to a very different battle for attention. So no more so than for news publishers who by their nature must cover a vast range of topics. And these challenges have been exacerbated over the past two or three years by the COVID pandemic, which other speakers uh, have spoken to. But that's really added pressure and strain to existing business models. Uh, and we heard from Paul Fletcher earlier how um, that was particularly heartfelt in the uh, Australian um, publishing landscape. But we face very similar challenges in the UK, both in terms of distribution and a fundamental collapse in advertising revenues, um, which have essentially become entrenched even as the economy uh, more widely has recovered. And that is especially true in the local news media market. But there are reasons to be very positive. Uh, and just yesterday in the UK, we published uh, JITREG, which is our um, audience measurement data, showing that audiences continue to flock to local news publishers as a trusted source of news and information in their local area. And that growth is almost entirely online. So just looking back to 2017, local news was read by about 22% of the population online. Today, that figure exceeds 70%. And according to a survey by one poll uh, published last week as well, 81% of people agree that they trust the news they read in their local newspaper and on their websites. And that's a rise of 7% since 2018. And I think in a world of mis- and disinformation online, trust in your local paper is a really important and powerful tool that we have. So things are going in the right direction. And I think that, uh, and that trust uh, is reflected across all age groups and demographics as well. Now, publishers have responded to the challenging or changing audience habits uh, and news consumptions with a variety of strategies. Uh, such as online subscription models, and we've seen strong success uh, on that front from the likes of the Times, the FT, and the Telegraph, scaling of mass audience, which Mail Online and The Guardian have done well, and building that into international audiences as well, and membership models, which have worked particularly well for some local and bespoke titles, as well as The Guardian, who have successfully built a revenue model based on donations, despite having no paywall and content freely being available to all users. So there are also innovations such as Axe8, uh, which aims to monetize content for smaller publishers on the basis of micropayments for individual articles via a digital wallet. And we're also seeing, as others have just touched on in this panel, investment in audio, in video, newsletters, and AI, which I think will all start to bear fruit as part of a blended revenue model uh, as the years go ahead. And recently, several UK publishers have expanded their overseas operations, particularly in the US, um, with investment in newsrooms abroad, and I think there's a real appetite for a UK perspective on some global news issues. But whilst there is plenty to be positive about, and I think we all should be positive, um, I would like to just touch on some of the issues raised in the Reuters Institute for the Study of Journalism report uh, last month, which highlighted that publishers are anticipating an extremely difficult year ahead, um, with pressures impacting on all areas of publishers' businesses, not least with double or triple digit uh, inflation rises uh, in newsprint costs and inflation pushing wages and other costs higher across the board. So while con whilst equally consumers are cutting back on discretionary spend. So that does add up to a real risk for title closures. And almost uniquely in the UK, we have to grapple with aggressive expansion by the BBC as a taxpayer funded um, media institution, which now dominates online news and is the number one news destination in the UK by some margin. They draw eyeballs and ad revenue away from commercial publishers. The BBC website in the UK does not carry any advertising and therefore loads much faster uh, and provides a better UX, which of course then translates into better search results uh, and search ranking. And the BBC has recently announced plans to expand its local news offering even more which has caused widespread concern among UK publishers and simply just wouldn't be accepted if they were trying to do the same in the print market. But for some reason, while the government gets the fact that readers are moving online, it has failed to, to understand the parallels in this market. So I stress the point that the challenges facing the industry are not a problem with audience. The demand for journalism has never been greater, but it is a problem with monetization, largely caused by the stranglehold of the tech platforms. 
Uh, so just to demonstrate this, uh, the challenge, this slide shows uh, the advertising revenue has shifted in the UK market over the last 10 years with a rapid and sustained growth uh, of digital pure play advertising rising uh, year on year, as you can see, with a sharp rise uh, post-pandemic. And that's largely going to two or three US tech companies, while the size of the advertising market for news brands, that bottom line, uh, has nearly halved in the same period. So that is the reality that we're facing into and the challenge that we need to tackle. So just before I move on to how I think we're going to tackle it uh, in the UK from a legislative point of view, I wanted to briefly share um, some highlights here of why audiences are coming to trusted news media sites. And they're turning to professional news publishers in times of crisis in particular. And we've seen huge audience growth through the pandemic years, and that has stuck. People came to us during the pandemic, and they're sticking with us. Um, and in, clearly in the UK, we've had a very busy news cycle over the last 12 months, not, to, not least, with three prime ministers uh, in a single year and the death of Her Majesty the Queen, as well as the ongoing cost of living crisis. And while we hear a lot uh, about news fatigue and people actively avoiding news, it is simply not reflected in the numbers. People turn to us not only for news, but as a trusted source of information too, and 62% uh, of the public believe that journalists play an important role covering stories such as the cost of living crisis. And that's a reflection of both the human side behind the inflation figures and economic numbers, uh, which we hear in the news headlines daily, but also as a trusted source of information in their local area, ranging from the cheapest litre of petrol or pint of milk to information on how public sector strikes are affecting train tables or access to healthcare. And on the big issues of the day, such as climate change, eight out of 10 people believe established media is driving awareness, which is well ahead of government and social media in the same studies. So despite what we sometimes read, independent uh, news media is trusted and it's valued by the public like never before, and is helping people navigate an increasingly complicated and noisy world, especially online. So the question, which I guess is very much at the heart of this conference, is how do we sustain quality journalism for the long term and maintain that investment in community reporting, in investigative journalism, and holding powerful to account in the way that only news media does that is so vital for society and democracy? Uh, so as I've touched on, we've seen audience, audiences move online to access news. Uh, and even here, we've seen a shift in recent years with rapid growth of mobile. In the latest audience data, which was published last week, there is an increasing number of people accessing news brands on their phones and tablets. Publishers' mobile content now reaches 20 million people every day. That's 94% of the entire daily reach. So nearly everyone who is accessing news is doing so via mobile, at least in part. And younger, digital native audiences also rely on news brands for trusted information in a crowded attention marketplace, with 14 million readers age 15 to 34 across print and online. News publishers reach 6 million more readers, uh, 6 million more people than Snapchat, and 5 million more than TikTok. But the money simply isn't there to sustain this position. Uh, and as you can see from this slide, there's been such a shift of advertising revenues uh, as one metric of change. Um, so 88% of news publishers' advertising revenue was derived from print uh, in uh, 2013. Uh, last year, that had dropped to 53%, and this year we may see digital revenues overtake print advertising for the first time. So publishers are competing in the online space. We are building digital models that work and that offer uh, advertisers the key audience that they're looking to buy. But growth in digital revenues is nowhere near the growth in digital audiences and falls well short of offsetting the decline in print revenues. And the reason? We're simply not able to trade on fair terms. And with the shift to mobile consumption, that entrenched power, particularly held by Google and Apple, will continue to be there unless something is done. So what are we doing uh, to balance, to rebalance the system and ensure uh, the online ecosystem uh, can be a viable place for publishers. Back in 2018, five years ago now, the UK government commissioned uh, Dame Frances Cancross 
uh, an independent academic to undertake a review into the sustainability of high-quality journalism. And the purpose of that review is to examine and make recommendations in four key areas. The overall state of the news market, the financial stability of the news market, the impact of search and social media, and the role of digital advertising. The Cairn Cross Review concluded um, and was published in February 2019 and laid bare the gross imbalance of power between publishers and tech platforms. Again, I was struck with the similarities in Paul Fletcher's remarks earlier, and I think the problem is clearly globally echoed and well-documented. Um, and to, you know, these, publishers, these platforms have a duty to act to ensure the sustainability of a diverse and plural media. And they should also see this that something is in their commercial interest, as it's our publisher's content that is driving engagement on those platforms. So Cairn Cross was followed by the Furman Review in 2019. That took a wider look at competition in the UK digital market. Uh, we subsequently had the CMA's digital advertising study, which demonstrated the, um, the excess profits that Google and Facebook were earning in the UK ad market. Uh, and there's been further studies uh, pointing out the consumer harm uh, of the, this exploitation and dominant market position. And I think that consumer harm point is key, as it's been a fundamental basis of discussion with government and it allowed us to move these arguments along. So multiple reviews have taken place over many years, and all of them have reached the same conclusion, that we needed a new regulator in the UK to fix a broken digital marketplace. The current system of competition law is simply inadequate, ineffective, and outdated, and highly connected, rapidly moving digital marketplace. And therefore, the Digital Markets Unit was born. So the DMU, as it's known, is housed within the UK Competition Authority. It was set up in shadow format in 2021. It has around 40 employees today, but it doesn't yet have the statutory powers it needs to operate. So in the NMA, we've led the charge lobbying government to bring forward this legislation as a matter of urgency. And I'm pleased to say, after much delay, uh, we expect the bill to be published by the government uh, next week. Um, sorry, next month, not next week. I'm too optimistic. Uh, <laughs> So with statutory powers, the DMU should be able to tackle the serious problems created by the tech giant stranglehold in the digital advertising and wider ecosystem. And this will be achieved via enforceable codes of conduct governing the relationship between online platforms and the businesses who rely on them, especially news publishers. The first task the DMU will have once that legislation is passed is determine, determining which uh, platforms have so-called strategic market status uh, and designate them as such. In order to do this, they have to uh, address three questions. The first is, the, is whether um, the platform has substantial market power, um, which is effectively whether uh, there is any, whether there's a lack of alternative providers of that service, um, and whether there's any lack of real threat of competition. Uh, the second is whether that market power is entrenched, meaning the power is expected to persist over time. And the third is whether the, the combination of those two and qualifying under the first two criteria gives them a strategic position that, in other words, a position that affects its market power and are likely to be particularly widespread or significant. To assist in that decision making, the DMU will take account of the firm's size and scale uh, in a specific activity and whether the firm is an, is an important access point for consumers. There'll also be a minimum revenue threshold, which is yet to be set and will be set in legislation, so that smaller startups or others in new areas will be out of scope, even if they have the potential to become dominant until they have reached such scale. Now, while we're not yet certain, uh, there will no doubt be plenty of wrangling over this, uh, as there always is when these companies are concerned, but we expect Google, Facebook, uh, and Apple to easily meet those criteria and be quickly designated. Um, and potentially others like YouTube and Spotify who will meet those tests to quickly follow. Um, and once, it's only once a platform has been designated, um, unlike the Australian model, that the, this regime will kick in. Um, and the, the DMU will be given the discretion to decide where, in which areas it wishes to act first. It won't be directed by Parliament to do so. We believe that the relationship between publishers and platforms will be one of their first priorities, not least because of part of the consultation process. They've specifically looked at that relationship. And in their advice to government, the two regulators said that this would provide one of the examples uh, of how a proposed new regime curbing the power of tech platforms could work in practice. So as part of the DMU regime, we expect legislation 
uh, to confirm that platforms will be instructed to negotiate for payment for content with news publishers. And I think there are lessons we can learn, uh, as we've heard uh, at different points today, around the world where this is happening and working and where it's not. Um, and I am most keen to ensure that a bargaining code allows for smaller independent publishers to get a fair deal. We do not want a system, as some have suggested, which determines a pot of money uh, that platforms owe us, then leaves the industry to fight it out over who gets what share of that pie. It is not for the state, either in legislation or through regulators, to determine price or commercial terms. So the way the regime is envisaged to work is not rigid legislation, but codes of conduct, which the regulator would set out it would be specific to individual platforms, unlike the EU model, which is more broad. And it would mean those big tech firms that have designated status would be subject to a code and would have to agree fair, reasonable terms for news publishers' content. And it's not solely about money. It's intended to be a broader regime which can addresses concerns on transparency of algorithms, gives publishers appropriate control over the presentation and branding of their content on platforms, improves practices around sharing of data between platforms, um, and readdresses the imbalance of bargaining power. So under the UK proposals, the code would consist of a set of legally binding obligations on the tech firms. Um, and there will be a backstop power to impose uh, final uh, binding, final offer arbitration. So I say again, this is not about special pleading for publishers. It's about creating a level playing field for both parties, publishers and platforms, with information to facilitate fair commercial negotiations. So I'm nearly coming to the end. I'm, I'm, I think I'm on time. But, um, so putting the problem into context, the NMA commissions a study by a leading academic from Cambridge University published last May that found that the British publishers' content generated approximately a billion pounds in UK revenues for Google and Facebook, a number that dwarfs by miles their contribution uh, back to the industry. Uh, this work drew on previous studies, including uh, colleagues in the US, as well as new analysis to look at the main ways in which uh, publishers' content, including the data, um, behind it uh, contribute to the revenues specifically of Google and Facebook. Um, this is not designed to be a figure that suggests uh, that those two platforms owe us a billion pounds, but it's simply a matter of uh, defining what the value of news content is to platforms and in order to start commercial negotiations. The study itself highlights the lack of transparency and data available to publishers on how their content is used, displayed, and engaged with on these platforms. And in part, that is why a new regime goes beyond payment for content uh, or a bargaining power and sets rules for greater transparency. We believe uh, that the new regime in the UK will provide the tools to drive fair negotiations between news publishers uh, and the platforms on which they depend by enforcing greater fairness, transparency uh, in the relationship. Upfront clarity on what is acceptable will help guide platforms and preempt or allow swift action to address practices that cause harm. Uh, so before I close, uh, I just wanted to reflect that I don't believe this new competition regime is a silver bullet to fix all the challenges we face uh, as a news media industry. This is an essential part of the toolkit, yes, and as I said in open, publishers embracing new ways of working to drive new revenues. Those will take time to pay off, but the future will likely require mixed revenue models that draw on multiple revenue sources to fund investment in quality journalism. Publishers serving audiences in different ways with news, information, and entertainment combined. So in closing, I just wanted to come back to this uh, slide once again, which I showed earlier. I think the business model of news has to change as audience needs and behaviors have changed. We are reaching more people than ever before, but we are reaching them in new ways. That is a good thing, but to continue investing in quality, trusted journalism, the rules of the game need to change. And I hope that is what we can achieve. Thank you. Thank you very much, Owen. I'll request you to stay with us for just a bit more. I believe there's a question for you, and uh, the question comes from Ruhail Amin, yeah. who's a senior editor of uh, Exchange for Media Group. Yes, Ruhail. Hi, a wonderful uh, session, you know, a lot of uh, important points made. Uh, one, uh, you know, uh, there's a resonance uh, in the room that uh, the model that UK, Australia has shown, how much can that be replicated in a complex ma market like India? What's your thought on that? I think um, 
I think it's, it's not necessarily a question of replicating it. And certainly we in the UK are looking at the Australian model as part of a solution. But we think that there are things that we want to do differently, not least that uh, the codes would apply and you would be designated. Whereas um, from Paul's presentation earlier, I think um, Australia hasn't actually designated anybody yet. So I think there, there are lessons to be learned. And I wouldn't pretend to be uh, an expert on the Indian market at all. But I think what is hopefully helpful is as different territories and different um, regimes around the world manage to put in place mechanisms that can support publishers and you know particularly now we've got um, enough time uh, seeing the Australian system roll out and how effective it has been it's about learning lessons and applying those in different markets uh, reflecting local factors so I don't think it's a sort of copy and paste exercise I think there will be different solutions depending on the market but hopefully um, by getting this right in certain places there can be lessons learned Thank you very much. I hope that answers your question. And while you get your question answered, can I please also request you here on stage to present a memento to Owen. And ladies and gentlemen, let's have a round of applause. Thank you very much, Owen, for your presentation and for taking us through an in-depth uh, knowledge about the subject that was discussed here or the topic that was discussed here. Ladies and gentlemen, be kind with your applause, please. Come on, everyone. That's Owen Meredith right here for us. Uh, thank you once again.